Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chris Hart and I work for Manchester University Press. I'm delighted that you're all joining us for what promises to be an excellent time chair event. So I'm soon going to begin uh, today's author talk with Sam Illingworth, but before we jump in, I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping. So firstly, thank you to everyone who's tuned in and is watching this live and interactive armchair event, number 12 of the series. On your screen, you should see an event dashboard containing the questions and chat options. The questions option is for you to type questions throughout the talk, which Sam will hopefully get around to answering in the Q&A section. Uh, please do ask questions because from the events that we've, uh, we've run so far, I do know that authors really enjoy the sort of interactive element of the, uh, the armchair event. So the chat option is for you to raise any problems during the event, particularly technical problems, which I'll try and fix as the event's going on. So as a brief introduction to today's author, Sam Ellingworth is a senior lecturer in science communication at the University of Western Australia. In his past life, he was an atmospheric physicist, but now his research is concerned with helping to develop two-way dialogue between scientists and non-scientists. He mainly does this through poetry, games, and by speaking about himself in the third person. So in addition to being an academic, Sam is also a spoken word artist and has performed his science poetry in venues across the world. So from Edinburgh Fringe Festival and the Green Man Music Festival to the Berlin Museum of Natural History and Google's headquarters in Silicon Valley. Needless to say, uh, Manchester University Press is, is delighted to be the publisher of A Sonic for Science, which reviewers have called hard to put down, beautifully written and uplifting. Uh, a book that finds humour, lyricism and humanity in the lives and works of scientist poets. So without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Sam, who will talk more about his excellent book. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks everyone for joining us for this armchair event. Um, I feel really privileged to have been invited to do so, and indeed to be a author with Manchester University Press. So as Chris has said, there's going to be time for questions and answers at the end. Um, before that, though, I'm just going to take you through what I hope to be a poetic or even a scientific tour de force of uh, my book, A Sonnet to Science, which I'm also holding here in front of me. This book, basically, just to give you a bit of a, a background to it, um, it started life uh, as a research project that I got a small pot of money for from the Royal Society. Um, basically, my friend and colleague Dan Simpson, who's a great poet based in the UK, um, we had a show together in the Edinburgh Fringe and Manchester Science Festival where we kind of poked fun at what's better, science or poetry. And Dan had a collection of poems about, well, about poetry. And I have a collection of poems about science written by poets, written by scientists. And as we were doing this, we came across like a large number of different poems that have been written by scientists. This made me think, oh, you know, there's obviously quite a lot of scientists who have written poetry through the years, and it'd be interesting to find out a little bit more about them. So I ended up um, successfully applying for this Royal Society research grant, and then that led to me doing the research and um, as a result of that coming up with a sonnet to science. Now, Sonnet to Science features six scientists um, starting from the 1800s. So, you know, we start off with Humphrey Davy, then we go into Ada Lovelace and then James Clark Maxwell and then Ronald Ross, Miroslav Holob and Rebecca Elson. And in selecting these poets, well, these, these scientists, what I wanted to do is I wanted to start around the time when um, science had really become more of a... Um, you know, more of a, more of an actual less of a privileged discipline and more of like an actual discipline as a whole um and so that was around the 1820s and then i wanted to have a, a basically a continuous line from there through to the present day conscious of the fact that i was only really able to select poets who wrote in english or who had english um english translate in, author sanctioned english translations because sadly the many, many failings in life i can only really uh, speak and understand poetry in English. So that's that's kind of how it came about. That's why I selected um, the poets that I did. And what I'm just going to do is I'm just going to briefly touch on each of the poets a little bit about how I think um, poetry played an important part in their lives and research, and then also read an example of uh, the poetry from these different poets. It probably comes across uh, that I have a uh, favourite scientists poets in this book um, <laughs> but you might make, make up your own mind with that so the first one is uh, Humphrey Davy now you know for those of you who don't know Humphrey Davy was this like, rock star scientist of his day right you know he did a lot of work in discovering some of the uh, earlier elements but he also did a, 
a vast amount of work in um, popularizing science um, working for the Royal Institution, really starting off those um, Royal Institution lectures. And as well as this, you know, he was a, a pretty decent poet. Um, he hung around with um, people like Samuel Taylor Coleridge, like William Wordsworth, Robert Southey, and they, they, they really rated him as well. I mean, Robert Southey said that he could have been or he could have been as, as successful a poet as he was a scientist, if that's what it had turned his mind to. And, you know, reading through his poetry, a lot of which is based in the, um, based around some of the spirituality he had around Spinoism and also around his, his love of the outside and of nature and especially of Cornwall, where he was born. And you, you read the poems and they are, they are, they are pretty, pretty aesthetically good. I mean, like objectively good. But what I really liked about Davy is that, you know, he kind of, he couldn't, he couldn't stop being a scientist. And, you know, he wrote a lot to his mother. Um, in, in, there's, a, there's a great collection um, of his letters that um, Sharon Rushton has helped to digitalize and um, is, are available online in the Davy Letters collection. And yeah, he writes you know, pretty funnily and he talks to his mum about the fact that, you know, he, he kind of wants to be, a, wants to be seen as a serious scientist. And that's one of the themes really that goes on through this book, this idea of people having to change or rather choose between being a scientist and being a poet. And so, you know, he can't stop being a scientist. And he's, he's hired at one point to do a lot of research into um, the benefits of nitrous oxide, because around the time, you know, people were thinking nitrous oxide might be this miracle cure. So what it is was he, he built this chamber and he used to get into this chamber and he used to expose himself to nitrous oxide or, or laughing gas for as long as he could, um, whilst taking meticulous notes about how intoxicated he was. And, you know, they didn't really surprise him. I mean, nitrous oxide was later used in the dentistry industry, but he didn't really find anything in terms of that. What he arguably successfully did was introduce nitrous oxide as a drug of choice for the aristocracy. But as well as taking these meticulous notes, he also had this theory that um, taking nitrous oxide would affect his ability um, to write poetry. So what he did was he'd go in there and he'd write poems and then try and comment on the quality of his poetry afterwards. And this is this is a poem that he wrote. And he, he, he had a theory that it would probably affect his capacity to write poetry in a good way. So this is the poem that he wrote about, um, about it's called On Breathing the Nitrous Oxide. Not in the ideal dreams of wild desire have I beheld a rapture wakening form. My bosom burns with no unhallowed fire, yet is my cheek with rosy blushes warm. Yet are my eyes with sparkling lustre filled, yet is my mouth implete with murmuring sound. Yet are my limbs with inward transports thrilled and clad with newborn mightiness around. And I would argue that actually it's a reduction in quality of Davy's usual poems. But what was really funny about this as well was he was trying to convince like all of his poet friends like Southey, like Coleridge Taylor, to go and expose themselves to nitrous oxide and also write poetry off the back of it. Um, but surprisingly, actually, none of the poets wanted to get, um, you know, laced up on drugs and do this experiment. So he just did it himself. But then as I talk about in the book, what was quite interesting is that, you know, later on in life, you know, when um, Taylor Coleridge wrote Kubla Khan, that was written as the result of, a, you know, a, uh, an, a drug stroke alcohol episode. So maybe he did have an influence. And, and Davy certainly had an influence on these poets. I mean, you know, the romanticism movement at the time was looking about moving away um, from science and technology. But actually, Davy and his 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 work about you know really trying to create science and make science something as valuable to society, arguably helped them to reconsider that. And you know Wordsworth, when he, he he writes in the prelude to his lyrical ballads about a man of science, is talking about Davy, and he had a really large and profound impact on those poets at the time. So up up next in the book is um, Ada Lovelace and. You know, Ada Lovelace is a, a pinup for um, diversity in science, technology, engineering, maths. She was the world's first computer programmer and, you know, did some really amazing work um, in theorizing the capability of a universal computer, probably about 100 years before Turing did. So this idea that if you were to create a computer um, and just give it a basically a, a, a 
create in such a way that you could give it any any program, any function, and it would be able to perform it. And you know, she hypothesized this around the idea of being able to give a, a computer musical notes and it could come create a sympathy from it. And she was a really remarkable person. Um, she was also the, the daughter of Lord Byron and um, you know, celebrated bad boy Lord Byron. And Lord Byron had you know, a pretty horrific reputation in England at the time and was actually exiled, um, mainly because he was probably having an affair with one of his relatives. And he was exiled and didn't really ever get to see his daughter shortly after she was born. His, his, his previous wife um, was partly responsible, stroke largely responsible for forcing him into exile. And, you know, throughout Ada's um, life, really, she spent a lot of time being compared to Byron and comparing herself to Byron. But actually, um, you know, her mother, Annabelle, who herself was privately schooled, she really didn't want her daughter to turn into this mad, bad and dangerous to know poet. So she kind of forced her daughter down this like science and maths education route, which for a woman in the time was was you know, pretty unheralded. And Ada's like intellectual capacity meant that she was obviously brilliant at this and went on to achieve great things. She also wrote a lot of poetry, and she you know she talks um, in again in her letters quite elegantly about the fact that her capacity to do poetry as well as science of computing engineering gave her this metaphysical insight that enabled her to make these large leaps into you know what a universal computer could potentially be and i you know i really i really enjoy her poetry i think she writes really and she was also really good friends with florence nightingale um, and obviously in, in the current class Hi, Sam. Sam. Sam's brink, unscathed through life's entangled maze, goes on to, and books she loves and wisdom's lore, for there her thoughtful nature feels the priceless treasure held in store, which to her earnest mind reveals those deeper truths that few explore, and busy life too oft conceals. And through her poetry, you really get to see her personality and, 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 and really the struggle, actually, again, with the identity of being a scientist or being a poet. And the, the final poem um, that I won't read, that I'll lead you for read for yourself in my book. But she writes about um, the rainbow. And, you know, people might have thought this was a religious allegory, but actually um, she's writing about this rainbow. And it's the last poem that she wrote. And it actually for, um, it forms is on her tombstone. And she writes about this um, rainbow, I hypothesize, because when she's um, first learning about like maths and science, you know, she's doing it because she doesn't, she, her mum's making her do it. But then she has this realization that actually it's something that she loves. And she starts writing to tutors who are like able to actually give her the answers that her, her normal tutor can't. And one of the first things she discovers and wants to find out more about is the double refraction inside the rainbow. So really this concept of writing about a rainbow is this realization that science is something beautiful to her and that she can that she can own and use in that way. So up next in the book is uh, James Clark Maxwell. And, you know, James Clark Maxwell would argue is, I don't know, maybe the, the most important poet of the sorry, most important scientist of the 1800s. James, like his fundamental laws of electromagnetism, are important in every single thing that we do. He he was, you know, a, a quite remarkable scientist. Um, everything he turned his hand to, he was able to do. Um, and he was also a really great poet. And he wrote poetry in a way. I mean, you, you can see, you can you can kind of judge his life through when he was having great scientific success and when he was having some difficulties in science, either through um, lack of a lack of ideas or because there were some external forces stopping him from doing what he wanted to do. And in these periods of inactivity in science is when he turned to poetry. And there's a great poem that he wrote when he was a, a student at the University of Cambridge. So there's this thing called a wrangler. Uh, I, 
which is basically the pers the undergraduate who gets the highest mark in the uh, mathematics degree at the University of Cambridge is, is the senior wrangler. The second wrangler is the person who gets the second highest mark, etc. And you know, it was this great mark of prestige to become a senior wrangler. And, and Maxwell really you know, walked, worked himself into having a, a breakdown at the time. Uh, and he, he wrote a poem about it. And I think it's just a great poem because it kind of reminds reminds all of us that even, even the most intelligent amongst us can find things pretty hard sometimes. Uh, so this is um, just about on being a wrangler. Deep St. Mary's bell had sounded and the 12 notes gently rounded, endless chimneys that surrounded my abode in Trinity. Letter G, old court, south attics. I shut up my mathematics, that's confounded. Hydrostatics sink it in the deepest sea. That's James Carl Maxwell there. And, um, you know, con continuing this chronology is Ronald Ross. Now, Ronald Ross is maybe someone that people are less familiar with, um, but Ross, you know, pretty important scientist. He basically uh, was the scientist who first made the link between malaria and mosquitoes um, and ended up winning the Nobel Prize for it. But he was also, you know, he, he was a very put upon, uh, in his mind at least, scientist and, and, and poet. And, you know, he really thought he was this, this great writer and people were just idiots for not understanding how great he was. Um, has to be said, I, some of his poetry, a lot of his poetry, a lot of his, um, you know, prose isn't particularly great. And it, it's certainly, you know, quite let's just say not self-effacing. And, you know, throughout, Ross is involved in quite a lot of controversy. Um, he, 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 he basically, he was the person to make this link between mosquitoes and malaria, but actually there's people who had been doing similar work at the time, like Degrassi, an Italian um, chemist and a physician, and also Sir Patrick Mason, who, who really worked alongside Ross, um, corresponded with him uh, whilst Ross was in India and, and, and Mason was in um, Scotland or in the UK. And, you know, really he came up with the first idea and, and suggested it to Ross and then Ross made these measurements. But when he received the Nobel Prize, he didn't really fully acknowledge the role in these that these other people had, had played. And so the, this idea of plagiarism and lack of citation kind of play, plagued him towards his latter years. And he was very bitter about, about this and about the scientists who he felt, who, or who felt he should have um, been more representative of. And, you know, as I was doing the research for the book, I was looking at the poems that he wrote. And I think there's a really strong case in his poetry um, for examples of plagiarism that he doesn't acknowledge either. So I'm just going to read you um, one of his poems and then another poem as well. So this is um, from a poem that he, a poem that he wrote uh, um, early on, and it's called The Night Ride. Who rides by the night in the starlight floor, a father with his child before? Oh, father, dear father, why ride you at night? And why do you ride with your sword by your side when all the small stars give no light? Okay, so that's, that's that poem. Here's another poem. So this is taken from uh, Goethe's you know, really famous ballad, uh, The Night King, um, and, uh, or Earl er Konig, to give it its uh, uh, original time. And um, here we go. The, the King of the Fairies is how it translates. Who rides there so late through the night dark and drear, the father it is with his infant so dear, he holdeth the boy tightly clasped in his arm, he holdeth him safely, he keepeth him warm. Two quite similar poems, I would say, but you know, um, what what Ross said was, he's like, oh I, yes, but when I wrote this, I'd, I'd never heard of Goethe, I'd never heard of him. And then when I was doing the research, I actually found out that he must have heard of Goethe because he actually entered a sketch of uh, Faust from Goethe's work into a um, into a drawing competition a couple of years before he wrote that poem. So Ronald Ross, who you know again did a lot of work in um, in epidemiology as well, was one of the first people to really think about that field um, and to put mathematics into into that area. Yes, he achieved great things, but I, there's an argument to be made that 
he didn't correct, correctly cite um, everybody in that role. W with poetry, what's really interesting with Ross is whenever he made his great discoveries, he would always make notes of them in, in poetry, um, which is, and he'd, he'd always use a form of poetry, the sonatile that he created, because obviously the only way to capture the work of Ronald Ross is through the work of Ronald Ross. Up next in the book is um, Miroslav Holub, and uh, Miroslav Holub, Holub was a Czech immunologist and poet, probably the most celebrated poet in, in, in the collection. And, you know, um, Ted Hughes called him one of the most important poets alive today when he was when they were both alive. And Holub um, lived in um, what was Czechoslovakia is now the Czech Republic under several different um, occupations, you know, the Nazi occupation, the different Soviet occupations. And he um, he had his identity stripped away from him. He was, um, you know, demoted um, in his role as an immunologist for writing out against the state. Um, but all the way through his poetry, he's just really playful. I mean, he, he has this great precision, though, that comes with, I think, being a scientist. He, he looks really at the heart of the matter and yet finds a way to write in a really uplifting way. And he, he said himself that, you know, being in a society in which he felt oppressed helped him to write this great uplifting and inspirational poetry. And there's a poem that I'm going to read to you now called The Door. And I think it just, um, what, what it does is it, I just think it summarizes that in a really beautiful way. Go and open the door. Maybe outside there's a tree or a wood, a garden, or a magic city. Go and open the door. Maybe a dog's rummaging. Maybe you'll see a face or an eye or the picture of a picture. Go and open the door. If there's a fog, it will clear. Go and open the door. Even if there's only the darkness ticking, even if there's only the hollow wind, even if nothing is there, go and open the door. At least there'll be a draft. I'm sure many of us can identify with that sentiment in the current climate. So then to finish with, um, we've got Rebecca Elson. Now, Elson was a Canadian um, astronomer and a really, really gifted poet. And she did a lot of work on the early um, Hubble Space Telescope, looking at early um, star formation. And again, when I was doing the research, what I found really interesting was that um, Elson's first research paper was she was the third author on it and it was about early um, star formation in early galaxies and it involved data taken from the um, what was the Anglo-Australian Observatory in Sydney and you know my first research paper I was the third author on and it was also taken using data from the Anglo-Australian Research Centre in Sydney about early galaxy formation. <laughs> so I found that parallel really nice. And, you know, Elson really um, was, was, a, was a fantastic, very gifted scientist, but she, she struggled um, in the field through, through rampant sexism. And as a result of this, didn't always share her poetry because, you know, she didn't want to be seen as the airy fairy woman who you know, wrote poetry and flowers and she, she she was a brilliant scientist and it's a real shame and so she, she she didn't really share her poetry as much as she could you know she was incredibly gifted um sadly she she died tragically young at the, the age of 39 from cancer and in her poetry she also it's remarkably brave and it, <clears throat> it talks about the cancer <clears throat> again from a scientific lens to some degree and it's it's really really powerful but I just want to read now probably my favourite poem <clears throat> of hers and maybe in the book as well. And it just reminds me what, why I'm a scientist and what it means to be a scientist as well. It's called We Astronomers by Rebecca Elson. We astronomers are nomads, merchants, circus people, all the earth are tent. We are industrious, we breed enthusiasms, honour our responsibility to all. But the universe has moved a long way off. Sometimes I confess starlight seems too sharp and like the moon I bend my face to the ground, to the small patch where each foot falls, before it falls and I forget to ask questions and only count things. I just love that so much, like that sentiment of responsibility to all, which is the name of her collection from Karkinet Press. But that last idea of 
before I forget to ask questions and only count things. You know, I have it as like a mantra in front of my desk. Because as a scientist, it's really easy to get caught up in the miniature of detail and forget about the bigger questions that we're asking. And Elson cuts to this beautifully and, you know, is, is really selfless in her writing and, and, and in her science as well. And the book really, you know, is this idea of introducing these poet, these scientists and the impact that poetry had in their lives and research. And really, you know, the central thesis of the book is that science and poetry are not mutually exclusive entities, but rather they are complementary devices that we can use um, in conjunction with, with one another in order to better understand the world and the way in which we live. And in writing the book, that certainly became even more clear to me. And I really enjoyed, you know, reading more and writing more about these scientists, finding out about their poetry and hopefully sharing that in the process. So hopefully you like what you hear. And if you haven't already bought my book, or even if you have, feel free to buy another version and give it to someone who will enjoy it. Uh, thanks for listening to me talk about that. And then I'm ready for questions now, which I believe Chris is going to field. Thank you. Hi Sam, thanks for that talk, it was great. I always enjoy listening to you um, speak about these poet scientists and the passion that comes through. Um, we have, we've got some questions that have come through and, and I, if anyone does have any questions, uh, please raise them and we'll get round to them. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick start by asking, do you have a favourite scientist poet? And who is it? Um, okay. <laughs> okay. I guess I guess it depends if what we classify as a scientist. But if we if we're saying people who self-identify as scientists and who are also poets, and that's one of the things really in the book that you know a lot of these people have uh, they, they want to be seen as a scientist first and as a poet second. You know, poetry is a really I guess subjective thing, but of all the ones in the book, definitely Rebecca Elson, just because I, I, her, her poetry is amazing, and it's so raw and so honest, and you know, she writes, for me at least, really, really effectively about what it means to be a science. She has these beautiful poems where she talks about, you know, looking through, like spending nights and nights and nights and nights looking at these super thick glass slides of the evening sky, trying to identify these tiny little um, blobs that indicate that there's a galaxy that's got an early star formation versus a late star formation. And the way she captures that, you know, <laughs> the boring nature of that task and the moment of incredible discovery in elation is, is just perfect. So like, I'd really, really recommend to any scientist, to, any, to anyone with a beating heart, really, to, to get her book, um, A Responsibility to Awe from Carcanet Press, because she's a, an, a writer, I think, who should be more rightly celebrated. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so just going on to the Rebecca Elson uh, analogy, do, do you find and did you find when you were researching the book that, uh, say, the poetry and a good grasp of language and style help these scientists in it, uh, articulate in their science and their discoveries? That's a really good question. I think I think it depends on the different scientists. I, For example, with Davey, Davey did a great job, I think, of um, being able to explain things um, in science in, metaphorically and, 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 and pick the right metaphor as well. And that definitely came from his ability as, as a poet. I mean, on the flip side of that, you know, people like Coleridge Taylor said that he used to go to Davey's lectures to, to find out about metaphor and how Davey communicated things. And I think there's... Um, there's a great lesson to be learned here as well because language is so important in science and oftentimes scientists will reach for a metaphor or they'll reach for an analogy or they'll reach for a comparison without really giving it great thought and there's I think the role of the poet um, to help the scientist through that process. I always think that map, mapping is a great example of this you know we talk about the map of the human genome as a, as a very readily off-the-shelf um, metaphor but a map is not really a good metaphor at all, I don't think, because a map is such a loaded political term. Like maps are, th are artificial constructs that people have decided lines are drawn on. And, you know, you show certain people maps and maps can upset people. So I think that introducing terminology like that without really thinking it through 
um, can be can be quite difficult. And I think Davy did a wonderful job of actually understanding that very very well. Um, certainly, you know, with with Ross, um, he captured a lot of his his scientific experiments in in poetry. You know, when he made when he first discovered that um, he made like the incision basically in in one of these mosquitoes and found that the parasite had been continued over in from mosquito to mosquito. He didn't write it down as a lab note. He wrote it down as a as a, a six line verse. And same with Davy. Davy would have um, notebooks, half of which were filled in poetry, half of which were filled with with science. So I think it, they definitely um, definitely infected and the, the, the way that they wrote. And the, the, the most successful ones, I think, definitely had that understanding of language that enabled them to communicate to perhaps a wider audience and as i said with davy you know he was arguably one of the first um, science communicators yeah thanks sam so i've got a question from ian here well it starts with a request so Ian's requested a signed copy which i'm sure we can sort out for ian and secondly yeah secondly he's asked uh, did you come across any scientist who produced objectively bad poetry and how do you know <laughs> the experience they document Oh, Ian, uh, I couldn't possibly say. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you honestly about this, right? When I first started reading James Clark Maxwell's poetry, I was like, this is doggerel. This is like forced rhyme, really not that good. Like he had this like poem where he tries to like crowbar in um, calculus and it just doesn't work. But then when I was reading more about Ma Clark Maxwell um, and about basically his objection to materialism and this idea and, and, and empiricism as well, he writes really elegantly and some of the rhymes are a little forced, but they contain such brilliant ideas that it completely changed my opinion about his about his ability as a writer. Um, with Ross, I'm maybe less convinced. It's just it's I think with anything in life, right? If somebody seems to be a nice person, your opinion of them is is slightly coloured um, or discoloured by it. And certainly from many of the accounts of I read of Ross, he wasn't he he wasn't always the most likable person, which maybe coloured my views and opinions of his um, of his work. But, you know, I guess in my research as well, I come across a lot of poetry that people might not think is um, aesthetically appealing. But for me, it's the process of writing poetry as well that's important. You know, it's the constructivism that's involved there. If somebody's written a poem and they've enjoyed that process and it's given them some catharsis or it's given them some greater understanding, then you know who am I to comment on whether I enjoy it or not? If it's done something for them, then that's fantastic and it's it served its purpose. Thanks, Sam. So I've got a question from uh, Rachel. Uh, it's Rachel here from Twitter, so probably familiar. So I'm really interested in what you're saying about identity and that idea of whether these are scientists, poets or poet scientists. It's interesting that in We Are Astronomers, uh, just myself, We Are Astronomers, uh, Elton defines astronomers in different terms, so nomads, merchants, circus people. Could you maybe say a bit more about identity and self-definition for these writers, perhaps? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think probably the best example in the book of the, of the scientist poets or the poet scientists is Holub. And he really struggled with this identity about, am I a scientist? Am I a poet? And he basically came to a realization, I, I hypothesize at least, that he was a scientist. And the reason he was a scientist um, and that poetry was a pastime is that he was then, you know, he was then able to fail at poetry. And having that failure because it wasn't seen as his like primary thing gave him the space, gave him the capacity in which to make mistakes that ultimately made his poetry really successful. And, you know, even just thinking about the word failure and how a scientist and how a poet identify with that word is very, very interesting. I think with, with all of them, they, they really struggled with the concept of am I a scientist, am I a poet? Looking at Ada Lovelace, you know, her, her mother really and her, her husband as well did not go along with this idea that she should be a poet or a musician. Um, looking at someone like Davy, Davy made the decision really to his um, that he was going to be a scientist. Um, he kind of made up for that a little bit later in life of doing a lot, a lot of writing and a lot of publishing, but he didn't really publish his work earlier on. And similarly with Elson, you know, she did 
she did some amazing well, you know she got her work published in like poetry and the rialto and was part of different reading groups but i know as a fact like from talking um to, to her friends and contemporaries that you know she showed her work sometimes a couple of times to supervisors who were like what is this you're a scientist and you know certainly from my own experiences of talking to colleagues and scientists who have many other different pursuits you know oftentimes they've been discouraged and been told you know to get back to the bench or whatever I think identity is such a personal word that it was it would really depend on the, the the individual whether they classified themselves as a scientist or as a poet speaking for myself for example you know I have as I'm sure many of us do great great sense of imposter syndrome around certain things so I don't know if I'd ever classify myself as a poet these days I don't even if, you know if I classify myself as a scientist I don't know really what I am so you know fitting yourself into these pigeonholes that are constructed by other people can arguably be um you know not beneficial to the development of your of your actual identity and blurring those boundaries blurring those disciplines i think is a, a really important step that all of us can take um going forward to try and break down these barriers and to try and explore this idea that you know science doesn't have to be the one that's doing like the research and poetry doesn't have to be the one that's doing the creativity because actually a lot of poetry has a hell of a lot of research in it and a lot of science is really creative so i think with identity it's about finding something that you feel comfortable with or that the scientist or the poet or the scientist poet or the poet scientist feel comfortable with without conforming to pigeonholes and ideals that have been created by somebody else to try and stymie your innovation. Thanks, Tom. So I've got a question from Wendy who's asked, uh, do you think that non-science poets, um, uh, poets who don't have a, a scientific background or, or training, can successfully write about a scientific field that they have no training in? Absolutely. I think that, that's, a, again, really good question. I suppose it depends on the poem, right? I mean, and, and like what's, anyone can write about anything that they want to. If somebody, is trying to write a poem that like explains a scientific topic um then they might need to have a little bit of understanding of it but I, i'd argue that the best poems about scientific subjects aren't ones that like do a this is a this is b this is c but rather that introduce the audience to the science and that that play with the idea play with the notions that's there so there's an argument to be made that in order to you know really get to grips with the fundamental question that's involved in a piece of scientific research you maybe need to understand it a bit more but i think that anybody and everybody should be encouraged to write poetry about scientific topics that find their interest look science is something that is a right for all of us and is not just a privilege for a select few and all of us have a duty in order to help that take place and i think that there's a bit a real problem sometimes with language and with jargon and with people trying to you know gatekeep science and saying well you can't possibly do this because you haven't done x number of years education and you're not the right person for the role whereas you know science is for everybody and everybody can do science to a certain capacity and then those people should be encouraged to do more as well and then finally just thinking about like those poems that work best in my opinion i can speak about my own um one of my own long-standing projects so i have a blog called the poetry of science you can just google search the poetry of science and my name and it'll come up and every week i read a piece of scientific research and write about it um to a general audience and i used to write poems that were very you know exactly a happens b happens c happens but they weren't very good um i don't think and then i came to the realization oh actually that's not what the poem needs to do the poem doesn't need to explain the science because the science explains the science what the poem should be doing is interrogating the science and maybe aspiring people to find out more about the science so now what i do is i write a poem i have a layperson's summary or a non-specialist summary underneath the poem so they can find out more about the research and then links to the research itself but then the poem itself doesn't have to explicitly identify you know what their hypothesis was what the results were but rather it's a way of um investigating what the, what the science might be about playing with it and getting people to think about it in a new light thanks Sam. okay i'm going to give myself the privilege of the final question so 
uh, and whether you could just talk about the reactions and whether there was a different reaction between to your book, sorry, from the science community and the poetry community, or whether you felt the two were very similar in terms of their reception. Wow, okay. Um, I think they're pretty similar. I mean, I've I've had, you know, pretty, well, very good reviews across the board, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and I think what the scientists and the poets and the hybrid poet scientists, science poets and social scientists, etc., all enjoyed about the book was that it was trying to explore the liminal spaces between the two disciplines and really thinking about what they had in common rather than the, the you know the mutual exclusivity of them i think that i was certainly more nervous about sharing the book um with poet contemporaries just because it's an arena that i'm not um as well established in and that i feel a little bit less confident in um but the positive reactions that i got to the book and continue to get to the book um have played a large part really in me continuing to write poetry continuing to do my own research into poetry and to think about um the next book along a similar line as well great thanks sam so i think that's a, that's a good moment uh, to wrap up this armchair event and thank everyone for attending but also particularly you sam uh, for giving up your time to participate uh, so for anyone who would like to get hold of uh, sonic to science so an email will probably follow, uh, well, it will follow, sorry, this event, and it will come out tomorrow. Over details about how you can order the book uh, with a 50% discount. Uh, so thanks, everyone. And if you enjoyed this event, why not sign up for future armchair events, which you'll find out more details about if you follow MUP on Twitter or sign up for our newsletters. So again, thanks very much, Sam. Really appreciate that. And until next time, thanks, everyone stay safe and keep well. Thank you.